the Buddha's teachings come in clusters. Or to be more precise, the qualities that he recommends developing meditation come in clusters. In fact, it seems like there's only one quality that he says is on its own always appropriate, and that's mindfulness. But even then, mindfulness, it turns out, gets divided into two factors. Mindfulness and alertness, the ability to recollect, to remind yourself of something, and then the ability to be alert. And the reason he teaches in clusters, though, is because every quality in the mind that's a good quality has to be balanced out by other qualities to make sure it doesn't go overboard and turn into something unskillful. This is why we have the five strengths and the seven factors to awakening and four sublime attitudes. We see the lists placed down one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. It gives the impression that you start with one quality and then you move on to the next and you drop the quality, first quality. Actually, it's more a question of getting all the qualities together and leaning in the direction of one or the other as is appropriate so the mind can maintain its balance. This is the principle that applies to the sublime attitudes. You start out with goodwill. It's not because it's the least advanced of the qualities, but because it's the most basic. And then on top of that, you build the others. Compassion, appreciation, or sympathetic joy. And then finally, equanimity. A balanced mind is one that knows when to emphasize any of the four. But it's not that you, ab you abandon the others. You try to hold all four of them together and simply use whichever one is appropriate for the occasion. Metta, or goodwill, lies at the basis of everything. In fact, you could say that it lies at the basis of the whole practice. If we didn't have goodwill for ourselves or for the people around us, the Four Noble Truths wouldn't make any sense as an important teaching. It's because we want to put an end to suffering. We'd like to see suffering ended not only for ourselves, but also for people around us. That we want to follow the, the path to the end of suffering. That we're concerned to find out what suffering is, how we can abandon its cause, and how we can realize its cessation. So metta is where everything starts. You stop to contemplate it. Why would you want anyone else to suffer? You might think about the evil things they've done in the past, the cruel things they've done in the past. But even then, why would you want them to suffer? Trying to learn a lesson. Well, they're going to learn their lesson because the principle of karma is going to take care of that. That's why the teaching on equanimity is there. So you don't have to go out and be the God's vengeful sword or whatever. Make sure that everyone gets their just punishments. When people have suffered the ill effects of their bad karma, you can't help but have compassion on them. You want them not only to stop experiencing whatever pain or suffering they're, they're undergoing at the time, but also to stop doing whatever is going to cause them to continue to suffer. This is an important part of compassion. It's not simply feeling a soft spot in your heart for people who are suffering, but also wanting to find some way that you can to help them stop doing the things that were causing the suffering to begin with. And when you find that you can help them, then you appreciate their happiness. You're, you feel sympathy for the happiness that they encounter. Even in cases where there are people who are experiencing happiness has nothing to do with you at all. You appreciate the fact that they're experiencing the results of their past actions or their present actions, and you don't resent their happiness. Even if you're in a contest and they come in first and you come in second and you felt that they, you really deserve to come in first, this is where you have to practice sympathetic joy. 
bigger, and there's some there's a larger box than the one you're aware of. And so you leave it to that. Notice in all these cases there comes there comes a point where you have to leave things for what they are. In cases where you want to help someone and you can't. Or you would rather see yourself gain the happiness that somebody else has. This is where you have to develop equanimity. It's interesting that the teaching on equanimity is a reflection on the principle of karma. And of the three chants, that, or the four chants that we have, it's the only one that's simply a statement of fact. The others say, may all beings be happy. May they be free from stress and pain. May they not be deprived of the good fortune they have, they're experiencing. The first three are wishes, attitudes, things that you would like to see happen. The fourth one is a, simply a reflection on the way things are. It's interesting this reflection turns up in lots of different places, in the five recollections, in the five reflections, excuse me. The reflection on karma is the one that gives hope. And as you realize that you are in charge of your actions. You're not simply a victim of fate, or of the stars, or of some other being acting through you. You're the one who's making the choices. And that's what gives you hope. In this set, however, it's the universality of the principle of karma is meant as a reflection on to develop equanimity, both for yourself and for other people. In other words, you come across incidents in your life. You can't gain the happiness that you'd like. There's some karmic block there. Well, you learn to accept it with equanimity. But that doesn't mean you just give up and become indifferent. It also means, well, look look for the areas where there is hope, where your actions can make a difference. Go, don't go butting your head against the wall in areas where you can't make any change. Focus on the areas where you can. So equanimity is not hopelessness. It's not indifference. It's there to redirect your energies in the proper direction for areas where you can act for your own well-being and for the well-being of others. The reflections on karma are also used as a basis for developing wisdom and insight, discernment. They form the background for all the teachings on discernment, that what you do makes a difference. So it's an interesting combination. Equanimity, hope, discernment, these things all go together. They hover around that same reflection. I'm the owner of my actions. All beings are the owners of their actions. In other words, they're responsible for what they do. It's interesting that and John Swat one time made a, gave a Dharma talk on this reflection, the difference between the anatta teaching and this one statement. Form, feeling, perceptions, thought constructs, consciousness, these are not self. But we are the owners of our actions. He said, think about that. In other words, don't latch on to the results of your actions. Latch on to the fact that you are making the decisions right now, all the time. Once a decision has been made, sort of into, in, it's been put into a larger circle of cause and effect that's beyond your control. But you do have a chance to make a decision again, the next moment, and then the next moment, and then the next moment. Focus on that. Don't get caught up in the results of past actions. Focus on what you can do now to make the present action skillful. That's the focus of the teaching. We're the owners of our actions, heir to our actions, where we're going to be receiving the results of these actions. So act in a way that you would like to receive the results. Be concerned about that. The, the Pali word is otapa. It can be translated either as fear of the results of your actions or concern for the results of the actions. In other words, you're not apathetic. You know that whatever you do, it's going to bear results. Here again, the quality of discernment comes in. There are lots of things we like to do that will give bad results, things we don't like to do that will give good results. And the Buddha said it's a measure of whether a fool or a wise person, how we handle situations like that. In other words, this is where the whole quality of discernment 
really shows its stuff, shows how worthwhile it is. You can talk about discernment, you can describe the three characteristics, the five khandhas, the six sense fears, dependent, core arising, emptiness, all these things, you can talk about them. But if they can't help you make the right decision when it's a hard decision, then that discernment is not really all that useful. Useful discernment is the, is the type that enables you to talk yourself out of doing things you would like to do but you know give bad results, or talk yourself into doing things you don't like to do but would give good results. That's where discernment shows its stuff. We're born of our actions. That's the next statement. Our actions are the source of everything we experience. So again, if you want to experience this to be good, focus on the source. If you don't like the kind of experiences you're having, turn back and focus again on the source. Because it's constantly right here, right here in the present moment. But Buddhism is interesting that even though it does talk about time, it doesn't talk about a beginning point in time. The beginning point for your experience is right here in the present moment. It all comes springing out of right here. So instead of trying to trace things back to first causes someplace way back in the past, the Buddha has you look for first causes right here, right now. Just dig down deep inside into that area of the mind where intention and attention and perception play against each other. Because that's the point from which all things are born. We're related through our actions, the connections we have in life among them, with different people are created by our actions, things that we've done together with other people, or done to other people, or done for other people. These create the connections that we have with the people around us. Interconnectedness is a very popular teaching in Buddhism especially nowadays. But it's funny that people like to talk about interconnectedness without the teaching of karma. They turn to dependent core rising as a model for interconnectedness. This web of connections where one factor can't exist without a whole lot of other factors. Well, they neglect to realize that dependent core rising is a teaching on how our ignorance is connected with our suffering, how our craving is connected with suffering. It's the kind of connectedness that you want to cut, not the kind of connectedness that you want to celebrate. Connectedness through karma can be either way. It can be good connections or bad connections. So you want to foster the good ones. And again, where do you look? You look at what you're doing right here and right now. How are you behaving with other people? How are you treating them? These create the relationships you're going to be able to enjoy or you're going to be stuck with now and on into the future. Kamma pati sarana. The translation we, we chant regularly is we have, we're dependent on our actions. But it turns out the word pati sarana means closer to meaning are the arbitrator, what, what passes judgment, what decides things in our lives. Our actions decide our lives. In other words, there's no judge up there someplace in the sky sitting behind a big throne passing judgment on us. We're passing judgment on what kind of life we want to have by the way we act. Which is both empowering and also a little scary because think about how many times you've acted on unskillful motives. And the unskillful motives you still have lurking around in your mind that could form the basis for other actions. When you think about that, it means there's work to be done. But not just to escape unskillful actions, but also to foster the skillful ones. This is where the hope comes in. That even though we may be suffering in our lives, there is a way out through our own actions. We don't have to sit around waiting for somebody else to come and save us.
we're not victims of fate. We can make the choices, we can order our priorities so that we can reshape our lives. You know, thoughts, words, and deeds. This is why we meditate, because meditation creates those good qualities, skillful qualities in the mind. The mindfulness, the alertness, concentration, discernment, persistence, truthfulness, perseverance. As we work at these qualities, as we put them into put them into action, they get strengthened. And they become more and more the arbitrators of our lives, deciding, pointing our lives in a direction where we really want to go. Then the final re reflection builds on that. Whatever we do for good or for evil, to that we fall heir. This is the reminder that, that we really want to act on our good impulses, our skillful intentions. We want to develop the qualities in our minds that will foster these skillful intentions, because these are the things that really make a difference. So these teachings foster equanimity in the sense that we have to be equanimous toward our past actions, the results from past actions. Certain things we can't change because they've already been done. We can't turn back the clock. But they foster hope right in the in the area that we can make a difference in what we're doing right here, right now. There is that opening for us to design our lives, to point them in a better direction. And that balance between equanimity and hope, learning how to make use of this principle, that's where the discernment comes in. The teachings on karma have gotten a bad rep largely because they've been mangled. They get, get turned into too simplistic an idea, either fatalistic or tit for tat. But if you understand the complexity and also understand the purpose of the teaching, you begin to realize it's not like what we thought. It's not an excuse to justify the suffering that people are going through or to become indifferent to it. You see other people suffering, that's actually an opportunity for you to help them. Because you don't know how much longer their karma for suffering is going to last. It might be a good thing if you are the agent to help bring an end to their suffering. Put yourself in their place. Wouldn't you like to have somebody come and help? And you may be in their place, too. Karma is not a teaching to make us feel superior to other people. Maybe that simply that the results of their past bad karma are coming faster than the results of our past bad karma. And we may someday be in a similar place where they are, or, or even worse. So we can't be complacent. And the teaching on karma is not designed to make you complacent. If anything, it's just the opposite, to make you uncomplacent. I once read someone talking about how September 11th burst his complacent Buddhist bubble. Well, that's an oxymoron, a complacent Buddhist. The whole purpose about following the Dharma is that it teaches you not to be complacent. As long as there's suffering in your heart, there's work to be done. So on the one hand, it makes you heedful, so you've got to do the work, but it also means that can, there is a way to work on the suffering. That's where the hope lies. If you understand the teaching on karma, you see how really useful it is. You see how relevant it is to the meditation that we're doing right now. Because the factor you want to dig down and find in your meditation is just that, the factor of intention. See it move, see how it moves, see how you can make it more skillful. See how you can perfect that factor so that it takes you not only into more pleasant places in space and time, but also when you get really skillful, it can take you outside of space and time, bring you to the end of karma. To the point where there is no more work that needs to be done. It's one of the descriptions of an arahant, gatang gurumiyang, someone who's done the task, done what had to be done. The burden is laid down. And it's the principle on karma, the principle on understanding the principle of karma that makes all that possible. 